Our scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 27, verses 13 through 44. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So as they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete, before long a wind of hurricane force called the Northeasterner swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on sandbars of Syrtis, they lowered the anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I, I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you, given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found out it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down to the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, You have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and he began to eat. They began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain in, into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground, if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach, but the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fa stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to pre prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land in safety. A little bit of a long scripture reading this morning, but it's hard to read half the story, right? Um, it reads very much like uh, 
the Titanic or the Edmund Fitzgerald or any of these shipwreck stories that we hear. And uh, yet the technology was, was different. The boats were made of wood. But that's not the thing that I want to look at so much this morning. Human life has often been compared to a voyage across a stormy sea. And maybe some of you know that even this morning. And so I want to look at nine things here uh, that we'll see in our own lives. Number one, often we can see the storm coming. We can see the storm coming. Now, there's lots of ways we, we do that, but don't, don't you sometimes know, uh-oh, something's, I can see this is going bad. Some part of our life or our family, and we, we can say, I see this coming. Now, a passage that I didn't read is a little bit earlier here. And uh, it says, Paul warned them, man, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. So Paul sees that this is not going to be a good thing. And he says something about it, but nobody listens. You ever feel like that? Yeah, don't raise your hand. <laughs> That's probably not good. Um, but did you ever feel like that? You could see something coming and you were completely powerless to do anything about it. That's almost as bad or sometimes even worse as, the, as what's going on is the fact that you're powerless. That's a bad feeling to be powerless. And that's where Paul was. He was a prisoner. He had no voice. You ever feel like you didn't have a voice? <laughs> something happened to you and... It really happened to you. You didn't cause it. You didn't want it. But you had to deal with it. So sometimes we can see the storm coming. Now, we're not talking here about the what ifs in life. I mean, you know, we can walk around all the time saying, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? Anything could happen. We're not talking about those things that just give us anxiety, but we're talking about the things that it's pretty predictable. You know it's not if but when something bad is going to happen. So often we can see the storm coming. Second, sometimes all we can do is hold on. All we can do is hold on. We get to the point where we realize we can no longer avoid it. We just need to survive it. And that's what happens here. They take the ropes, and being a, a wooden ship full of grain, they take ropes and put underneath it to kind of help tie the thing together. <laughs> that sounds pretty scary in itself, doesn't it? If you have to tie something together with ropes to hold the boat together, but they do what they can do to hang on. It's not a great fix, but it helps. And, you know, that's, the, that's something we can do is just hold on. Do what you can do, even if it feels like nothing. It very well may be that these ropes that they put on kept them afloat long enough to get to where they needed. The boat could have collapsed some, somewhere else without those. So do what you can do and just hold on. You know, sometimes things don't make sense. I don't know if you've had a sh shipwreck in your life or not. Um, you know, I have, and I couldn't figure it out for a, long, a lot of years. It was something that happened that I didn't have any control over. And boy, it turned my whole life upside down. A choice that somebody else made. And it essentially cost me my job, my ministry, my house, time with my kids. And it didn't make any sense. And sometimes, even when it doesn't make sense, all we can do is just hold on to Jesus. I had people even come up to me and say, How's your faith? Are you, you still believe in God? You still, after everything that happened to you? And I said, 
like Peter, where else would I go? This would really be a dumb time to turn my back on God because he's all I got. <laughs> and you know, when we're going through the storm, all, sometimes all we can do is just hang on. Hang on to Jesus and trust that he's going to somehow get us through it. Do the little things that we can, you know, undergird the ship. And number three, and Bonnie's children's sermon goes pretty well with this. We need to get rid of excess baggage. You know, isn't it ironic how as we live, we collect things? And sometimes those things own us instead of the other way around. And sometime when you're, sometimes when you're going through a storm... You have to lighten the load a little bit. Now, I don't know what that means for each one of you. Sometimes it means giving up some responsibilities to say, you know what, in a, in a different time and place, maybe I could do this and this and this, but right now, I, I cannot do that. So it might be giving up responsibilities, narrowing some of those. It might be just getting rid of things and stuff and simplifying life. You know, simple is a good thing. What they had to do to survive is they had to get rid of excess baggage. First, they got rid of the cargo. Now, a little history about these ships. They were grain ships that would carry grain from Egypt to Italy. And so that was their main purpose. But then they would also make some extra money by carrying 276 people. That's a pretty big ship. 276 people and other things that needed shipped. So cargo, excess stuff that they would just kind of pick up some extra money by, hey, we're going this way, throw what you need on there. So that's the first thing they got rid of is the cargo, their extra income. But survival becomes more important than life's extras sometimes. And you know, it's here that sometimes we have to make some really tough decisions. You know, where am I going to spend my time and where am I going to spend my energy and how am I going to survive this storm? And sometimes I can't survive it with this and this and this. And you know, as we seek God, he usually helps us thin things down a little bit. Sometimes... We don't even have any choice of the way he thin, thins things down. But often we need to make some tough decisions if we want to survive. The next thing that they, sh they throw overboard is the ship's tackle. All of the things that they need and all the things they need to land correctly. Because uh, guess what? They're at the mercy of the sea and ultimately of the God. And... So they get rid of the tackle. Eventually, the lifeboat. There were a couple who were going to, you know, sneak the lifeboat in and try to jump on it and hope that they could get to land. And they got found out, and uh, the lifeboat was cut off. Now, this, was, this is a backup plan. And you know what? Often in life, we have a backup plan, but the backup plan isn't a good plan. You know, some t often in life, the backup plan can be part of the problem. You know, God has a single will for our life, a single focus. He wants us to follow him. He has a plan. Now, in a normal situation, it's not a bad idea to have a backup plan, maybe some money in the bank or something there, you know, that's, that's a wise decision. But when you're in a storm, sometimes the backup plan can be extra baggage. And sometimes you, if you, can, look if, you can look for a way out that's not God's way out. And that's what happened here. He had already promised them that they were going to, everybody was going to survive. But these guys thought, I have a you know, I have a better plan. I'm going to sneak off the ship. If you think about it, it doesn't make sense anyways, does it? If a great big cargo ship is being thrown all over the place, 
a little boat is not going to do better, I wouldn't think. Finally, they got rid of the grain, the main purpose for the journey. They basically gave it all up. They gave it all up. I don't know if you've heard this saying, but I think it's very true, that sometimes Jesus can't be all that you want until he's all that you have. Sometimes it's not until he's all that we have left that we really hold on. And they basically threw away their financial future. They had bought the grain in Egypt and they were on their way to Italy and they gave up on the whole thing and they just were clinging to their lives. The main goal of the whole voyage got abandoned just so they could survive. And maybe you've been in a situation like this too where the whole the whole goal, everything you were about, everything you were doing seemed like it got, had to get abandoned if you just wanted to survive. This grain was also usable for extra food, you know, if they needed to, they could, they could eat it. But they threw it overboard. Number four, Sometimes we lose all hope. Sometimes we lose all hope. It says, when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Now that's Luke speaking. He's not speaking necessarily for Paul. Uh, Paul may have had hope, but everybody else we know lost all hope. I don't know if you've ever been to that point where you've lost all hope. It's a painful place to be, you know? Hope is the assurance of a better future, that things are going to get better. Whether it's in this life or the life to come. And boy, when you lose that, that's, that's hard, that's sad. And you know what? Nobody else can really pull you up either very well. Sometimes, and we often call this brokenness, where we get so completely broken by life that we say, (laughs) you know what? It's, it's, It's humbling. It's desperate. And sometimes in the, in the, um, in the process, we, we lose all hope. You can't see the end of the tunnel if you want to use that visual. Or the saying, All I see in the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train. (laughs) You know, sometimes it feels like that. Here we come to grips with our faith. Here's where we really ask the questions. Lord, are you in control of my life no matter what? Often we can't see it. We say, "I, I can't see how this can even come out salvageable. But you know what? Jesus, I'm trusting in you. And I'm holding on. And even though I don't have any reason for any hope, our faith remains. Number five, hope returns. Hope returns. But it's a different kind of hope. It's a present hope. Paul's talking to them, and he says, But now, now, I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Their first hope was to save the ship and everything in it, and therefore survive themselves. Now this hope is different. They're not worried about the ship anymore. The ship is gone. Or they know it's going to be gone. But they hope to get to land and be able to start life over again. And, you know, personally, 
I'll, I'll share a little bit. You know, I had, I had invested a lot of years um, in schooling and things like that. I, it took me five years to get my bachelor's in biblical studies and ministry. And it took me 10 years to get a master's in biblical studies. And in 2001, I couldn't stand to preach for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or however long it took. And because of some things in my family that were falling apart, I resigned. And I never thought I would preach again. I never thought I'd preach again. And I knew that God somehow had a calling, and it felt like all of that that I had, and money that, you know, a lot of money invested. I'd look at my books because my focus was on biblical languages, and I had a whole bunch of books, and I'd look at them, and I'd drag them from place to place. And every time I look at it, looked at them, it was like, why am I hanging on to these dumb books? Because I'm probably never going to use them again. And I even got to the place where I said, you know, I don't even know if I want to go back into ministry and fight the fight that it is. And, you know, but I, I couldn't get away from the sense that God still had something going on. God still had something going on. Then in 2015, Ron Burns gave me a call and left me a message. And you basically know the rest of the story. Never could have seen it. It was a different hope. It was a different hope. 14 years, you know, you kind of... <laughs> You kind of just give up. And yet God had a hope. And I'm sure these men thought, if I can get to land, I can at least start over sometime. And when we go through the storms and everything's lost, that becomes the new hope. And it's a present hope. You know, if you look back and you say, boy, I wish, I wish things were like they were then, that's not much of a hope. But if you say, hey, you know what, how can I make tomorrow a little bit better than today? That's a hope that'll work for you. Because we have to deal with where we're at, not where we used to be. And some of these storms, they can beat us up badly. And I know some of your stories or parts of them. And you just have to start from where you are today and move on. What can I do in the future? So hope returns, and it is a, a future hope and a present hope. Number six, look for God's voice. Look for God's voice. And it often doesn't come very quickly, both in this story and in my experience and with other, working with other people. God's voice often doesn't come quickly. Often it's, it's a time of silence. I remember going to the place where it seemed like my prayers were always answered and God did wonderful things as I prayed for them, to the place where I felt like I couldn't pray myself out of a paper bag. You know, it was like, <laughs> I still prayed, but it was kind of like you just couldn't hear God's voice. And it always takes a long time, or usually takes a long time. And he doesn't always give us the miracle that we want and that we pray for. But he does give us the assurance that we need. In some way, he says, you know, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Have courage. And, you know, a couple ways is look to godly people. Paul was not a seaman, but God gave him wisdom. He had traveled a lot on the sea, so I'm sure that he knew a lot by observation, but that wasn't his main job. And Paul kept his mind while others were overwhelmed with panic in this time of crisis. So you can look to godly people who are able to keep their composure in a time of crisis. And if you've been in situations where there's crisis, isn't it interesting how... Some people kind of rise to the top. 
They're able to keep their head, and everybody says, okay, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to what's going on here. And so Paul was that person. They respected him as a man of God, even though many of them didn't even know anything about the God that Paul served. But they respected him. And so look to godly people. He kept his mind while others were overwhelmed. And, you know, I love the show of Paul's humanness here. He says, you know, if you guys wouldn't listen to me back there, we wouldn't be in this spot. You ever want to say, I told you so? It's usually not a good idea, but there's something that you just want to say, I told you so. If you would have just listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. And sometimes, like Paul, we say it. You know, how many times in history have people been saved by listening to godly men and women in a crisis? And as an act of God's grace, he says all of the people on the ship are going to be saved too. How many times is an ungodly world blessed because as Christians, we are part of their lives or their plan? You know, we'll never know those things, but we know that lots of times that that happens. You know, our country has no idea how much mercy and grace it has received due to the faith of Christians living in it. You know, maybe God's plan for you saved a whole company or something. God wanted you to have that job, and so he says, I'm going to save the whole company, and everybody else is going to get blessed too. Isn't it neat how God does that? So look to godly people while you're looking for God's voice. And then finally, Paul heard from an angel of the Lord that the ship would be lost, but everybody else would be saved. Number seven, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Paul urges them to eat some food. Have you ever been seasick? <laughs> Bad feeling, isn't it? Can you understand why they didn't eat food for a long time? <laughs> and, I mean, yeah, I got kind of seasick once on La after I was on Lake Erie. And, you, you know, you come home and the bed's still doing this and all that. And that was little waves. That wasn't a storm. That was just a daily thing. I cannot imagine how horribly sick they must have been. But Paul says take care of yourself. You know, when you're going through a storm, that's the one thing you can do is you can take care of the basics. Try to sleep, try to eat, drink some water, you know, just the basic things. Because sometimes we forget to do those. And Paul encourages them to do that. Number eight, threats may remain, even when you see land. So they're all thinking that we're going to make it, and Paul says we're going to do this. And then the soldiers decide, you know, we're going to kill all the prisoners just to make sure that nobody gets loose. So they didn't get in trouble for losing prisoners. But the centurion steps in and prevents that to happening. You know, so sometimes when you think you're almost through it, there's another threat that comes up. But you know, the very God who promised to get you through the first threat will get you through the second one. Then finally, number nine... Keep your faith. God's promises are secure. You know, hold on to verses in Scripture. Hold on to what God has spoken to you personally, and you know it. You, you know it deep within your heart. And others will get blessed along with you. And you know, there's, there's different people in the storm. You know, Paul has faith, confidence, and leadership. That's his role. Luke is a God-loving Christian with faith and confidence, but he's not in a leadership role. Aristarchus is, has solid faith, and he's just following along. And you know what? There's unbelievers who have survived some storms, but they haven't yet become a follower. We don't know the end of this story that if some of these people... Now, if I'm on that ship and I'm not a Christian and I see that happen, I'm going to say, hey, wait a minute. The God that Paul follows, I think that's for me. I want to follow a God like that. But you know, not everybody does. And we don't know if any 
of them did or not. But the storms, they can strengthen us. They can give us a new sense of life. And so I don't know where, where you are in your storm or if you're in a storm right now, but you know what? Don't give up. Hold on to Jesus. Follow these steps as Paul encouraged them to do. And you know what? No matter what, you're going to survive. We have eternal life, which means we are, we're going to survive forever. Whether it's here or there, <laughs> we're going to survive. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace that gets us through the toughest times, things that we can't even imagine. And Lord, you love us and you carry us. You empower us and you give us hope. And God, I pray for each person here that you would give them hope today. No matter what's going on or what storm they foresee, Lord, we pray that your grace and your honor would be with them as they go through it. And we pray it in the name of Jesus, our, our loving Lord. Amen.